Hello, my name is Richard. I'm a doc student at, at Oakland University and a licensed therapist. And today I'm going to do a uh, lecture for you guys on ethical decision making in the context of whether or not to report uh, suspected child abuse. Well, let me rephrase that. If it's suspected, then yes, you should report. So the broad topic is reporting child abuse. Um, in my own experience, this is the most common ethical problem you're going to run up against as a therapist. And I'm saying that as someone who works in private practice, who does not work with kids, it still comes up pretty frequently. So if you do work with kids, if you work in the schools, if you work in community mental health, anticipate reporting more often than I do, which is probably about twice a year. Um, this is a common issue, like I said. It's going to involve several big concerns that you're going to have to work through every time this issue comes up. It involves whether or not to break the confidentiality of your client. It involves protecting children, and that's a societal value and a professional value. It involves um, potentially harming your therapeutic alliance with your client. That's a tough thing to do because you're breaking their trust and running the risk that they'll never come back to therapy. So it, it's a hard decision. It's a big decision to make. And if you do call, you might be harming your own finances. And that's a big, hard decision to make when, let's say you're in private practice, you're just getting started, you don't have a lot of clients. Are you going to lose this one? Can you lose this one? So that puts you in, in a big, a big problem. So, but we're going to talk about how to handle this because that's going to be the answer is having a model that you can go to that can give you reliably information and a decision that you know is going to keep you safe and make sure that all the, the professional values, your personal values are looked after. Um, now, this is going to be a personal model that you're going to create, Hope, but I'm going to show you how maybe I've created mine, right? And you can copy that, borrow from it, but hopefully I hope you're thinking about yourself in your own practice as we're going through this lecture. Um, and there's going to be the, you're running the risk that people might make complaints about you either at work or to the state, and can you still do the right thing even running that risk of people complaining about you? Or can you overcome the threat of people complaining about you to do the right thing? And that, that's always a tough decision to make. Um, you might notice I'm using this cool gaming headset to talk to you. It's because the microphone on my computer doesn't work, and I also wanted to look really great for you guys. So that's why I'm doing it. Um, so we're going to look at the three decision-making models that Dr. Branson has already um, shown you guys. We have the ACA, the ASCA code, ASCA, and the um, ASCA and ASCA are the same thing. I'm just saying the whole thing together, you know. And then the social constructivist way to do it. So ACA, ASCA, and Social Constructivist. All right. So with the ACA and ASCA, we're dealing with the uh, linear process. Um, ACA code has six steps. ASCA probably has a few more because they always have to have a few more. Um, at least recently. But the ACA code wants you to apply the ACA code of ethics. Surprise. Identify the problem. Well, first you identify the problem. Right? You need to know that there's a problem before you're getting into the ethical decision-making process. But then they want you to apply that ACA code. They want you to apply the ACA values of, of um, autonomy and doing good and avoiding harm and justice and fidelity and um, or loyalty. If you don't want to use the other language words, you want to use English instead of Latin. Um, and then after you've looked at all those values, we're going to generate options, evaluate options, get rid of the ones we don't like, keep the ones we do, and try to just whittle down to just one good course of action to make. So ACA provides you a nice linear model of how to make decisions. At the same time, it doesn't really get into too much detail about how to actually go through those steps. It just says do it. Apply the ACA Code of Ethics. Well, it doesn't really tell you how to apply, right? 
and then determine the values and how it inter well they, they don't really show you an example of that so so on one hand the ACA does give you a nice um, linear step model to doing it but it doesn't really tell you how or or give you guidance in that way so maybe that's in one way the ASCA code is superior to the ACA because it, it does get a little more handbook like for you and, and if you feel in the need of a handbook it, it's probably a good bet to even if you're in mental health counseling look at the ASCA code because it, it definitely applies especially whenever you're dealing with children um, and the social constructivist code I like because it doesn't really give you a linear model right it gives you um, guidance actually this is what you do forget steps this is what you're gonna be doing um, and in a way that can be really valuable so at the end of this I'm going to show you how I combine the three into my own model um, but the social constructivist model we're going to, we want to obtain information from people involved and that's important from this theory right because objective truth doesn't we can't really get to it we're, we're all dealing on our subjective realities the more but the more we can connect with others, the closer we can approximate a, a good decision. So we want to get other people involved. We want to get um, decision makers in that um, we can consult with important people from the community, from your professional community, from the legal community, all those communities that are part of our society that are interested and involved in this decision. We, we need to involve them. We need, there needs to be some sort of discussion with them and not make a decision in a vacuum because it, you don't live in a vacuum, so don't try to make a decision at one. So we, we're going to obtain information. We're going to assess relationships and the connections between different sources of information. We're going to consult with colleagues and professional experts, negotiate between parties, and work towards consensus. Because the idea is, if similar to the ACA code, if we've gotten rid of all the bad options and then you're left with one, well, that's probably your best option for a variety of reasons. From a social constructivist standpoint, if everyone can agree on an option, that's probably your best option. Um, so there's different ways of whittling down. The ASCA code, like I said, it's a little more uh, handbook-like. Let me just read you the code. The, the steps real quick define the problem emotionally and intellectually so we're understanding emotions are a big part of decision making we're going to apply the ASCA eth ethical standards so similar ACA code apply the apply our code because we, we wrote it so apply it um, consider the students uh, developmental levels and chronological age and that consideration is always important especially about child abuse you want to understand how this action is impacting the development of this uh, this person and if it's hurting the development if there's a big impact on, on their well-being from from whatever you're talking about it's probably abuse and maybe it should be something reported um, you need to consider parental rights and minors rights when you make these decisions the minors rights to have a healthy you can look at societal rights and values with that, but also the legal rights to confidentiality. There's a different standard when you look at minors, especially when the minor's under 14, there's much less confidentiality due to them. But ethically, to as part of that therapeutic relationship, you, you should try to keep that confidentiality as much as possible. Um, and we're going to determine potential courses of action and their consequences, that's like ACA code, developing options, evaluating options, consult, so this is where ASCA and social constructivists uh, overlap, we're going to involve a consultation, we have to have a consultation, and then we're going to implement the course of action once we've decided on our own that it's good, and we've consulted with another professional that it's good, then thumbs up, do it. All right, now I'll show you how I've kind of combined them, and maybe this will help you when you're thinking about how you're going to go about making these decisions. All right, so we're gonna do some kind of problem identification. And we wanna be careful with problem identification because there might be hidden problems that you're not aware of. So it's important to look for maybe something that's hidden when you do this. Two, I want to get outside information. I'm sorry if you can't read my writing. It's been a lifelong struggle. 
outside information means codes, laws, colleagues, anyone important that you can legally consult with. And in here we need to understand rules of like HIPAAs, exceptions. Um, if it's consultation, you can always talk to another healthcare provider without getting a waiver, th things like that. So th th that's an important, you need to understand and, and use the resources that this course has given you to research the different laws, right? I only have about 20 minutes, about 10 more minutes right now to, so I can't really show you all of HIPAA, right? But so, so we, we need to understand where the law lets you consult and then do that. Um, because don't make decisions in a vacuum. If, if I can leave you with one piece of solid advice here, it's never, ever, ever make a decision in a vacuum. Um, you just run the risk of, of you, you being wrong too much. And the, these are really important. I mean, it's, it's hard to understate how important decisions like reporting child abuse are. Um, and then after we've done all this, we want to take some kind of action that is mutually agreed on and consistent with values. All right. So the case study I want to go through. So the, this is a court case called People v. Cav Ioni. Not really sure that's how to pronounce it, but this is the court case that other Michigan courts cite when they talk about whether or not to, um, you know, what, what the legal standard is. So it's an important case for, uh, to know when you're looking at reporting child abuse. So the, let me just run through the case facts here. And uh, you can feel free to like rewind the video if you want, you want, you want my steps again. But so we have a therapist We have a nine-year-old, we have a father, and we have a mother. We have a social worker. And lastly, we have a prosecutor. So these are our six kind of actors that are gonna take a part in our story today. Um, it's, it's not the happiest story, but. So the mother, actor number four, calls the therapist and says, hey, I think my husband is molesting my nine-year-old daughter. Now to pause for a second, that's where I would have made the call, but it, it, it goes on from there. The therapist didn't make a call at that point. The therapist said, okay, let's all come in for therapy. So the therapist where does family therapy therapist is a licensed family uh, therapist and a psychologist um, has all the credentials so so it's not a problem of competence or anything like that so but so the therapist decides to work with the family the nine-year-old tells the therapist that her dad touches her inappropriately and sexually and um, the therapist then goes to the father and says do you do this and he says no and if I've ever touched her it was an accident and the therapist decides not to report so the nine-year-old then goes to school and talks to the school social worker and tells the school social worker what she told the therapist. The school social worker calls CPS. CPS does an investigation, refers it to a prosecutor. The prosecutor then comes after the therapist and charges him with a misdemeanor for failure to report. Um, that's one of, one of the consequences for failing to report. For making that decision not to call, you're running the risk of being charged with a misdemeanor if it ever goes ever gets that far so he gets charged with a misdemeanor he gets convicted of the misdemeanor he appeals his conviction all the all the way up to the Michigan Court of Appeals and this is where we're at now the therapist tried to say like hey you know it's a reasonable suspicion and I looked into it and I just I didn't from the information that was given to me it wasn't reasonable to, to suspect abuse I thought the father was much more credible um, 
Now, here's the problem. The court looked at him and said, well, I don't know if they looked at him, but they looked at his argument and, and rejected it. It's like, no, that's not your job. Your job is not to investigate. Your job is just to look at those words in isolation, those words of, my father touched me inappropriately. My father touched me like this. And that's on, on his face, receiving those words, would you suspect that those words might be true? Not believe, but suspect that they might. And, and that's really the standard you're working with. And so they rejected all his arguments. He tried to bring in the Constitution to say that the statute is unreasonably vague or violates the Fourth and Fifth Amendment rights of his clients and violates uh, the First Amendment right to freedom of speech. The court didn't buy, it, didn't buy his constitutional arguments says, no, suspicion is a pretty good standard and easy to apply. It's not, but that's what the court said. And other courts have gone with this reasoning. And in this, this case, even though it came out in 1988, has definitely held up the, over the course of time. If there's another case like this, this case is going to be the, the one providing the precedent for it. So it's important to know people the Cavallani and also the facts of this, because those facts are pretty common. Something like that is probably going to happen at some point in your career. So now we have to look at how to apply uh, our f four or five steps to reasoning, depending on uh, if you want to look at problem identification as a step. But I think it is an important step because of hidden issues. Though in this case, there isn't too many hidden issues. There's a lot of maybe hidden consequences, but there's the one issue. Should I report this to the CPS? All right, so problem identification. Do we report to the CPS? Yes, but we'll, we'll get into why, right? Okay, so we want to consult old, outside information. First, we're going to look at the law. The law says reasonable suspicion, you must report. That's it. It, it doesn't really explain what um, in, in too much detail about any kind of nuance. If you look into it really closely, you might see exceptions for um, in the law for like if the for prayer maybe um, like did the did the these parents not give the kid oh, uh, medical care because of their religion? There's an exception for that. The criminal statute for child abuse exempts from child abuse reasonable dis uh, discipline, um, but. I, I wouldn't get too much into that that kind of stuff if you're just talking about reporting. Because remember what you're doing. All you're doing is alerting CPS to the possibility of child abuse. You're not telling CPS, I know that child abuse happened. You're just talking about, it might be possible that it happened and you need to investigate. That That's what you're doing here. And so the standard is really low. It's just, do you suspect that the child might be, the parents are going over the line could the parents be going over the line? Could harm be happening to this child? That's what you're, you're reporting on. Um, so we're going to look at, so we want to consult the law, and that's what the law is going to tell us. And we're going to consult codes of ethics. Codes of ethics definitely give you an exception to break confidentiality for reporting child abuse. That's always going to be there. Um, in the ACA code, it's explicit. In the ASCA code, it's explicit, of course, because you're dealing with, I mean, you're dealing with the school. Um, so the law is telling you you have to. The ethics code is telling you that, yes, you need to. Um, and then you can consult with uh, colleagues. And this is a good place to consult with colleagues, mostly for those reasons I was getting into earlier about how um, you can get into trouble here with, um, with your own values, your own subjective reality. So you need that reality check. Applying values is simple in this case because we want to do good and avoid harm, mostly to the one who's most vulnerable, and that's the child. Um, you can look at from, is the child my client? No, it's not. But as a society and the law and your profession, they're always going to tell you we protect children first. So that And that's the social context you're practicing in. Um, consequences for not reporting. We're looking at misdemeanor, uh, danger of making someone angry at you, either the person you're reporting or the person who or the victim, uh, loss of license, able to be sued civilly, rep, reputation harm, continued abuse of the child. I don't think, I think this is the key part where that therapist broke down in his logic. I don't think he, he really thought that the consequences were going to apply to him. 
the, the consequences did. Um, and he ended up in, with the misdemeanor. And so the action is you must go through the reporting. Our therapist did a lot of stuff wrong, and I hope you don't going forward. Um, so that, that's all the time I have. So just to wrap up, we want to make sure that we go through that careful decision-making process. The one I highlighted for you pulls out elements from ACA, ASCA, and social constructivism. Um, and if I can highlight one more thing before I end, it's just always, always, always have a consultation um, relationship with another licensed healthcare professional and, and put that in your informed consent that that's what you do to make these ethical decisions because that, that will help you be true more often than not. And also, also under, have a good understanding of the over, overarching arguments and values associated with the issue you're in. With child abuse, the societal value that you're facing is to protect children. So above all else, you protect children. And that, that's the society we live in. So thanks for watching, and I hope you guys have a wonderful semester, and good luck. See ya.